everyone, and welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. Um, today, I am with a familiar face to one and all. Our state rep, Sean Garbley, is joining us today. You will probably only see Sean's face, um, and it won't be moving, and yet he will be talking. He is amazing that way. Um, in fact, uh, he's got some video problem, some video issues, so we're just going to go with the audio for this interview. The content is what matters after all. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. James, thank you. Thank you for hosting and thank you to ACMI for allowing me the opportunity to speak to my constituents. We love to give you that opportunity, Sean. We're happy to do it. Um, let me ask you, as we, as we open practically every interview we have these days, um, how are you faring? I, I, I'm doing well, um, and I'm wishing you health and safety to you, your family, and to the ACMI family as well, and to the residents of Arlington. Thank you very much. Um, so, Sean, just let, you know, we're doing basically a legislative update, um, which we do regularly, um, but of course, under anything but regular circumstances. So, um, I'm sure that a vast, vast majority of your time and energy are being taken up uh, by COVID-19 related legislation and work. Um, so why don't you just, you know, dive in wherever you would like uh, to start bringing us up to speed on, on some of what it is that you guys are working on right now. Great, well, I, I appreciate the opportunity and I apologize that I can't be with you in person, but obviously social distancing is really important to combat uh, this virus. And I would recommend all of our residents to practice social distancing um, whenever possible. And you know, this is a disease that has hit so many of us. It has hit me personally, and it's hit many people across Massachusetts. You know, we have well over 42,000 cases confirmed. You know, that means that we're tested, and it's certainly most likely higher than that. Um, we've had well over 180,000 tests get performed. I know we have over 180 cases of COVID-19 in Arlington. So this is really impacting all 351 cities and towns. Income level is not a factor. It is really impacting all of us. And because of that, people are scared. Uh, people are scared whether or not they are worried that they may have corona or a family member or loved one may have it or they might have lost their job and they don't know where to go, where to turn to. And as their state representative, one of my jobs is to represent them at the state level and be a liaison, so to speak, between them and the different agencies of state government. And I can tell you that my phone has been ringing off the hook for the past couple of months and it has not stopped. And I can tell you that I am getting anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 calls and emails uh, during one week. And oh as, you, as you can imagine, the vast majority of those calls and emails are from people who just lost their job. And they are worried about how to put food on their family's table, how to pay bills, how to pay their child's tuition and fees for college. Um, and so I've been helping them, um, along with the other members of the delegation, get through to unemployment and figure out, you know, the, the Massachusetts laws, as well as the laws of um, unusual unemployment. Those who are gig workers, those who are self-employed, those who usually do not qualify for regular unemployment do now based on the federal CARES Act, and so trying to help them navigate the law and be able to collect the important um, revenue from that law so that they can take care of their families and keep safe. Um, so there's a number of pieces of legislation. James, if you want me to go through them, I, I certainly can, what, whatever you would like. Yeah, well, let me ask you, first of all, um, I know that the kinds of constituent uh, direct constituent services that you were just referencing um, are something that is part of your job at all times. Um, but of course, at this time, it sounds like it has become 
the, uh, the overwhelmingly uh, large proportion uh, of what it is that you're doing. Is that, is that, a, is that an accurate impression? It, it is. Um, you know, certainly I'm working on important legislation and trying to get past priorities passed. But when you have, you know, 10 people calling you in a, in a span of one hour, letting me know that, you know, they haven't heard from unemployment, they applied, and they are five days without any type of resources coming back from the state, you know, that is a cause of concern and worry. And I do try to drop everything to try to help that individual access the benefits that he or she um, is qualified to receive. Um, and so I, I think it's incumbent upon all legislators, all elected officials to really help our constituents navigate this pandemic together. Yeah, and before we get into the legislation that I know that you are working on, even uh, you know, even as you, you field uh, these, this is kind of astonishing number of phone calls and contacts um, uh, on a daily and weekly basis. Just before we get to that, I wanted to ask you about a very kind of specific uh, piece of data uh, that we've picked up, which is. Um, you represent uh, West Medford as well as uh, a large portion of Arlington. Mm -hmm. And one thing that has come to light is that, the, um, that there is a higher incidence of COVID-19 per capita in Medford than in Arlington. It's, and yep. it seems like it's not insignificant. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering both what, if, if there are, you know, explanations for that and also if, if you and others are addressing uh, that as as an issue? So it's a great question, James. As we know, right, nobody is immune from the coronavirus. But we do know that there are vulnerable populations who are more um, susceptible to the uh, negative effects of Corona-19. Some of those folks are the elderly and other folks with pre-existing health conditions. And certainly Medford has been hit very hard uh, by co the coronavirus. One of the ways it's been hit hardest is those uh, living in nursing homes. So the city of Medford has three nursing homes that have been really impacted by corona. One of them, um, we as a delegation have been working to get uh, supplies, you know, PPE, the critical supplies that it needs, as well as help um, from the National Guard. One of our nursing homes has over 50 deaths from the coronavirus. That's not 50 positive cases after testing, that's 50 individuals with one, within one nursing home in the city of Medford have what, lost and, their lives. And, and what is the population of that nursing home um, you know, in general? So it's around 185 beds. So it is a oh significant population has lost their lives um, within that nursing home. And Are you so, able to share the, the name? Because we had not heard about this. Um, of, the, of the nursing facility or, or, or not? So it, it hasn't been released officially by the mayor. Yeah. So I want to wait. Fair uh, enough. You know, Fair I enough. can talk to the mayor of Medford and, and share that facility's name with you at a later date? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure that it will come to light, obviously, when you're talking about upwards of, you know, more than 25% of the population of the facility has now not just contracted the virus, as you mentioned, but died. Uh, that, you know, I, I don't have words to describe that. That is really horrific news. I'm, I'm very yeah, sorry. no, it's, it's, uh, it's scary. Um, so I actually, so thinking about it, I do, I do believe it is public information. So it's the Courtyard Nursing Care Center in Medford. And so I, I don't want to get into the specifics of how this has happened, but that is sure. the nursing facility. But there are cases across our nursing facilities in Medford. And so the National Guard has been in. We're working very hard to try to support uh, the current individuals who are still there and making sure that they're quarantined from those who are also 
um, sick or were exposed by COVID. Mm -hmm. So is that, um, uh, is the, both the density of, or, or the number of uh, elder care facilities, and then, you know, some of these just terrible um, outcomes that are that are that are occurring in within them is is that kind of the the main explanation for the the higher incidence um, in Medford as far as people understand it in terms of the nursing homes in Medford I, I think there will have to be an investigation done as to how this unfolded in the kind of magnitude that it has you know the only other comparison that I've seen is in there a couple of nursing homes in the Littleton area that were really hit and of course the uh, exactly. inexcusable outcome of what happened at the Holyoke Soldiers home right um, you know th there needs to be an investigation done obviously I'm not pointing fingers at any individual but those are a lot of souls to lose um, much yeah. higher than the usual that we've seen across nursing homes across the state. There has been no nursing home that I've that I have heard that is literal that is immune from this tragedy, from this pandemic. But as you pointed out, James, the what courtyard is going through is very, very high. And so while I'm not pointing fingers, obviously I want to make sure that that facility is given as much support from the state as possible to make sure that number doesn't continue to rise, um, but also to find out what is the explanation for why this has occurred. Um, Understood. All right, well, well, thank you for that. And um, yeah, let, let's proceed to, uh, to hearing about, like, obviously there are so many different kinds of needs that, 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 uh, that, that require addressing for different segments of the population. Um, you had mentioned that you've been getting, an, uh, you know, the, the largest number of calls that you get are around uh, people's uh, having lost their jobs or being concerned about how to make up for income that is, is no longer there. Um, is that the main thrust of your efforts um, in the legislature as well? Or are there other things that are kind of just as, as, as exigent right now um, that you're tackling? So there's a, there's a couple of themes, right? One is doing the work to try to get all of us as a Commonwealth through this pandemic. And two, this pandemic has highlighted, in, in, in my sense, that we are, uh, that many of our most vulnerable populations, um, that we don't have the appropriate safety nets to address many of our vulnerable populations. And so two, what do we need to do to get through this pandemic? And two, how do we secure the safety nets so our most vulnerable populations are, uh, are treated better and can flourish after this pandemic and, and during this pandemic? So in terms of the specifics around, um, you know, what do we need to do to get through this pandemic? I mentioned, you know, nursing care facilities, long-term and short-term facilities. Uh, you know, obviously the issue around transparency, how is this happening? What, you know, what is going on and how do we move forward is very, very important. So I know the House of Representatives recently passed legislation to require long-term uh, and housing facilities to report and track the corona cases that have been positive and their mortalities. And so that is really important in terms of just transparency so we can get the information um, you know, to the command center, but also figuring out how the state can be helpful to cities and towns that house a lot of these uh, you know, long-term care facilities. Um, Another one, James, is around the civil liability protections for healthcare workers. Obviously, a lot of healthcare workers want to help. They are helping. Um, we are so lucky to have them, and they are literally putting their lives and their health on the line to care for the most vulnerable populations across the state. But many of them are concerned about civil liability protections. Um, 
you know, so we, we did pass and the governor signed it into law that puts civil liability protections to allow them to care for individuals at the very best of their ability. And I think that is really, really important. Uh, we recently, uh, it was actually a house initiative and it was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor that places a moratorium on eviction and foreclosures. Um, this legislation is actually the best and the strongest in the country if you talk about housing advocates. And this is important because it'll mean no one will be thrown out of their homes during the pandemic and a couple of months after the pandemic or after the state of emergency is declared over by Governor Baker. And that's, that really, that's really important to support the most vulnerable. Right. And I'm wondering, does that apply to business businesses it, as well? It does. Yeah. So it's, it's both uh, commercial properties and your personal property as well. Okay. And, you know, Sean, I've been asking you about the legislation that you've been working on and that has been recently passed, et cetera, without actually clarifying uh, how is it that you guys are getting this stuff done? How is uh, oh, state yeah. house business <laughs> being conducted right now? So that's a great question, James, um, and, and one that is kind of a constitutional question. So in, in state government, there is something called a full formal session, and that is when representatives and senators physically go into the building and vote on these pieces of legislation from our, our, our respective chambers. There is something else called an informal session. And under the constitution, we need to be uh, in session every 72 hours, but the constitution doesn't dictate if it should be formal or informal. So an informal session is when you know you have a presiding speaker, a Democrat, a Republican, and things that are deemed as non-controversial items or items that have not been objected by anybody can get passed. These are things like liquor licenses, home rule petitions, uh, sick leave banks, things that are deemed easy to get through. Mm -hmm. All of these pieces of legislation are passing during informal sessions. So that means nobody is objecting to any of it. Right. Because if they did, it would get laid upon the table and we would have to take it up during a formal session. The House of Representatives right now is in the middle of, de of a debate in an informal session trying to come up with rules on trying to have a full formal session remotely, virtually. And we're trying to get that done because we do have several other pieces of legislation we want to debate and pass that we know are not going to be unanimous. So we can't pass it in an informal session. Right. I mean, clearly, it's great that you guys can get any business done in the informal session model, given the fact that, again, as you pointed out, a single objection is enough to table that. Uh, but I imagine that there's just no way to to, to address a majority of the things you need to um, in through this mechanism because you're just not going to get that agreement without debate and deliberation, I would think. You're absolutely right, James. Both pieces of legislation addressing Corona-19 and legislation beyond Corona. You know, we're still trying to pass some very important pieces of legislation, not to mention we still need to deliver and debate a budget. Yes. <laughs> A minor point, huh? Right. Um, so, um, and the only the only other two things I will mention yeah. because it is important for the town of Arlington is we did um, pass to extend the state income tax filing deadline to July, and so that was important for a lot of people in Arlington. I heard from a lot of constituents on that, as well as we passed legislation extending the date for local elections and flexibility for town meetings that town moderators could exercise. And those were two important pieces of legislation for Arlington that allowed the select board uh, to extend the date for the uh, municipal election from April to June 6th, um, I believe, and obviously doing some changes around town meeting. Okay, Sean, that you're Absolutely right, and I'm very glad that you uh, took the opportunity to mention those last couple because we've heard from others uh, here in town about the significance of that legislation uh, for us here. Um, 
let me ask you, Sean, this is, um, this is a, well, so it, it's complicated and we understand that, but uh, g give us whatever clarity you can. Um, thinking about the fact that uh, we are hopeful that we will be uh, passing the surge period, um, you know, now-ish, uh, I'm talking to you in the, near the beginning of May, um, and that in a month from now, things will look uh, somewhat brighter or slightly more stable in terms of uh, dealing with the pandemic. On that assumption, um, people, I think, are already, at least with some part of their minds, trying to conceive of what things are going to look like on the other side. How are we going to reopen, uh, so to speak, the economy and reopen for business? Um, I'm sure that um, you guys have done a lot of thinking about that and that there is uh, uh, legislation or, or, or action uh, pending around all of that. Clearly, economy can't be shut down completely. And you've already mentioned that the budget itself is part of what it is that you still need to do, um, even under the current circumstances. So here are my questions. Number one, what is, how do you figure out a budget when you don't know what the economy looks like uh, going forward, number one? And, and number two, you know, how, what are the major, uh, the major obstacles or the major challenges that you feel like you need to tackle and be ready with appropriate legislation or policy uh, as we start to come out of this? Two, two great and very important questions. Um, one of the reasons, or two of the reasons we haven't had, so usually the House debates the budget the week after school vacation in April. And the Senate follows de deliberating and debating on their budget sometime in May. Two of the reasons we haven't done our budget in April, obviously, as you mentioned, James, is the whole issue around, you know, not being able to get 160 members to deliberate in close proximity in the House chamber. So it was concern around that. But also, the revenue picture is really unclear. So whenever you deliberate a budget, it's based on the revenues that are available that, that haven't been just projected, but we know are coming. And so each month we get a revenue estimate of how we're doing for revenues that particular month. And, what, and we had a virtual ways and means hearing where many ec economic experts, experts who understand the economy statewide and also nationally and how this or any pandemic impacts an economy obviously is going to impact revenues and revenue growth. So we had that kind of, we had that hearing and it was very clear from us and I serve on the Joint Committee on Ways and Means and that it was very clear to us that the March revenue numbers we're not going to give us the kind of forecast that was critical for us to make any assumptions around future forecasts for revenue uh, growth, or, or in this case, a decrease of revenue. The April numbers, will, April and May, will certainly allow us the picture of what the revenue picture will look like and will allow us to deliberate in a budget. And, you know, the House has not decided when we are going to deliberate our budget, but I, based on what we've done recently, my assumption is it's going to happen sometime between the end of May and July, whenever we are able to have a strong enough sense on the revenue numbers that we can deliberate. And between now and then at that point, because we can't operate, as you would most wisely say, James, we can't operate without a budget. How do, how do we do it? So we do it just like we did in other years when the House and the Senate is negotiating to get one budget. It called a one budget, where we pass a budget for one period of one month until we are able to okay. deliberate on the budget. So like a series of stopgap kind of, uh, you know, month by month uh, funding as you work your way towards the towards the consensus you need for the, the larger budget. 
Um, Correct. That, that makes a lot of sense. And also, I think, again, worth reiterating what you just said about the fact that March, which is the last uh, period of time, I assume, for which you have fairly firm numbers, was not representative. Uh, that's the old normal, right? And now right. we're in something and moving towards the new normal. And you guys have to have some time in order to be able to absorb that. That, that makes a lot of sense. So I, you know, I have served as a member of the legislature during our last recession, and that was back in 2008, 2009, even 2010. And I can tell you, I deliberated and voted on a budget that when the budget went from the House to the Senate, during that time, when it traveled through the hallway to get to the Senate chamber, we lost about $4 billion in revenue when the banking industry collapsed nationally, which set us on a course for a deep, deep recession. And so that is what we're being mindful of. We're looking at those revenue projections, most specifically in sales tax revenue and capital gains tax revenue, because those are the most important in terms of how we spend our dollars on, on vital programs for the Commonwealth, but those are also the numbers that are the most volatile and they change. And during a recession, those are the numbers, those are the revenue numbers that are going to change the most. Just out of curiosity, Sean, what makes those the most important in normal circumstances, the, the sales and the capital gains tax? Is that because they amount to the largest pot of money? I, I, you know, my, my sense is because they're the most volatile, that when you have an economic recession, right, like, you know, we, we have restaurants that are not open, we have movie theaters that are not open, people aren't spending their money. And because of that, revenues do tank. And that's a, similarly how it happened in 2009. So that is, those are numbers where watching, where other sources of revenue are probably, they could, um, you know, they could fall quite a bit, but, you know, we'll look at what the numbers are the end of April and May. But my hunch would tell me, just based on my experience of the last recession, that those are the two uh, revenue numbers that are going to fall the most. Mm -hmm. And I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, I can't see. I can't see any flaw in your logic, unfortunately. There, Sean. Um, and I think you're probably, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no magic calculator out there that's going to come up with a better answer. I don't think. But um, James, I, so I just, I also want to touch on the second part of your yeah, thank question you. was around reopening. And, you know, I know my constituents are turning on the TV, whether whatever news channel they're watching, they are certainly seeing other states start reopening. So I, I just want to remind folks that places like Florida and, and Texas and other folks they are reopening slowly. So some of them are doing, you know, 25% occupancy and places like movie theaters and, you know, places like restaurants. So it's not a full reopening. You know, I, I still believe we really do have to err on the side of caution and make sure that we reopen slowly because if we do reopen, just like other states, you know, I think are doing unwisely and you know based on what the health experts and folks in science and medical fields say that if this disease does continue to um, increase to that amount we're going to be in an even worse off position than we were when this first started obviously we want the economy to to start again we want people to go back to work we you know certainly I, just like everybody else, want to start going back to restaurants, want to start going back to movie theaters, want to, I want to see the Boston Bruins play for the Stanley Cup. <laughs> you know, these are things that we can all agree that we want to see, but we also have to be careful of the unknown. And so certainly, you know, the governor has extended a couple of times now the stay-at-home order. These are conversations that we're having with his administration in terms of um, you know, how we are going to reopen, but the way we're going to do it is not based on emotion. It's going to be based on science, and it's going to be based on fact. 
And I think that's really important. And people have to understand that this is not a made up disease. Um, James, as, as you know, um, and I, I really don't want to bring this up, but I will because this has touched everybody, including myself. You know, last week I lost my father to Corona. Um, and it obviously has had a very devastating impact on me and my family and our friends. But this is happening to families all around the Commonwealth and all around Massachusetts, We're all around Massachusetts and all around the country. And what we do know is that there is a high probability that there is going to be another surge sometime in the fall. And so in terms of reopening, I want to reopen, but we need to do it based on the facts and the science that's medically available. And I believe that Governor Baker is doing that. So a couple of things, Sean, uh, the first of which is um, I know that it costs you to make reference to your father, a, a very recent loss and a very real and devastating one for you. So I appreciate your, your, your being willing to share that uh, with us. And I'm sure I speak for the rest of our audience uh, as well in you know, giving, sending you our uh, commiseration and, and very best wishes because as you said, it, nobody's immune, uh, but boy, you have been hit very hard. Um, so our best goes out to you. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask you about, and this is, um, you know, I, I, I'm just gonna ask the question and I hope that, that you know, yeah. you, you feel like you can answer. Um, the fact that there are states opening up um, right now, whether gradually or more dramatically, et cetera, uh, I think that there's a lot of the American population and a lot of the population here in Massachusetts who sees that in the way that you've already described as being probably premature and possibly, uh, you know, dangerous and unwise. Um, I'm wondering, however, whether you and others would recognize that we in Massachusetts and the other states who aren't doing that right now might benefit, in fact, from what happens, what we wa are able to watch transpire over the next uh, weeks and months uh, in Georgia and Florida, Texas, wherever else uh, they are taking yeah. such steps, uh, such that we have better information um, when it comes to doing that, you know, to following the same process ourselves. Yeah, you know, you know, we, you know, we're all in this together, and so no doubt we can learn a lot from other states. And I think that's something that we certainly will do, certainly in terms of what not to do, but certainly as to what to do as well. You know, I've read uh, the governor of Ohio's reopening plan. It seems very well thought out. Um, other plans, I don't, other states' plans are not as well thought out and they seem to be too much based on emotion. Um, and kind of a sense of urgency that we want to do this, and I can understand that. So, you know, we certainly will learn um, and we will watch and learn from best practices. But, you know, it is important to understand, too, that way back in November when we saw this happening in China, you know, many of us, you know, during that time were out to eat, right? We go to Nairab Joe's, we go to Trist, we go to Tango, we go to Jimmy's. Nobody was looking around and thought that this disease that was impacting the lives of so many people on the other side of the world would come back to the, would come to the United States as quickly as it did. So because of that, we also have to be mindful that when other states open up the economy, and if they are negatively impacted in those states and we see a spike, that impacts Massachusetts as well. And so we have to be mindful of that and set up regs that I believe we have that prevents that from happening. But, you know, it's important to understand that, you know, even though, you know, we are far away from some of these other states, for the most part, we are one community, right? And what impacts one will impact the other, um, as we learn from this disease starting on the other side of the world. So. Um, we can't be blind to that. Well, for sure not. Um, 
Sean, there are things that we talk to you about, uh, issues that you uh, have devoted yourself to uh, as, as a politician and a, and a representative of the people um, for your whole time in office. Um, things like climate change and health care and mental health care, et cetera. Um, we are interested to get uh, an update if there is any um, on progress that you're able to make around any of those issues or whether it's all been swamped uh, by, you know, pandemic, directly related uh, pandemic legislation. Um, so I wanted to, I, I do want to invite you to, to give us an update around, around any of the perennial issues that we talk about uh, that you do have anything new to report on. But I did also want to ask you and preceding that, so just my, my question right now, and then, and then feel free uh, to also address these other issues. Um, we've talked about vulnerable populations, and I know that in general that is a great concern of yours and a, and, and a galvanizing um, cause uh, of yours in forming legislation. One of the populations that we haven't mentioned in this conversation, but we've talked about with many others recently, is uh, because of the hot the kinds of hot spots uh, that this pandemic. Uh, highlights. Uh, we've already mentioned the elder care facilities. The other place is jails and prisons. Yep. Uh, um, so I'm wondering um, what you can tell us about anything that is being addressed within the state house uh, around this issue of, um, you know, just these places being kind of petri dishes uh, for the growth of this, of this virus. Yeah, no, I, it's, a, it's a very, very important question, James. And I, I would highlight you know, when I say vulnerable populations, I, as you just pointed out, I would say those who are incarcerated. I would also say those who are immigrants, right? If you see some of the highest cities that have been hit with this disease, it is places like Lynn with very high um, immigrants and immigrant populations. So um, is your, your question is well taken or your, your point is well taken as well. So there are a number of pieces of legislation that have been filed that I am supporting around incarcerated populations. And one of them was filed by a colleague of mine, Representative Sabadoza from Northampton. And it's a bill that I am supporting, that I am co-sponsoring. And it would really mandate um, the state of Massachusetts or you know, the, the folks across the street to set up a process for looking at how you um, you know, split up that population, right? So they're not so concentrated in one area because we do know that social distancing is very, very important to combating this disease, this pandemic. And we know, you know, I, I tour prisons a lot in my role as a state representative. And we know that many of the prisons in Massachusetts, social distancing is not possible. And because of that, we know that the amount of Corona-19 um, on our prison population and our employees who work at our prisons is just skyrocketing. And I haven't seen actual data in terms of the population. So one is I want to see the data in terms of what are the public health, uh, ask, you know, what is going on right now in terms of our prison population, but two, What's going, what is Governor Baker going to do about it? And I think this legislation is important and it's a good first step. You know, it does not say we're going to release everybody, right? What it does say is that we are going to set up a system to look at each facility, to look up each specific situation and come up with ways to make social distancing possible, right? Whether that's removing inmates from the current location, that certainly has to be part of it. Because, but we also can't continue uh, to go the status quo as Corona is just, you know, I, I have been told just based on what I've been reading that Corona 19 has increased, the cases have just skyrocketed in many of our incarceration centers across the state but I haven't been able to get my hands on specific numbers. And because of that, 
that concerns me. Mm -hmm. um, I also heard nightmare stories coming out of Bristol prison over the weekend that does involve um, some undocumented immigrants in terms of, you know, hostile workforce. So that has, I have a lot of concern with that. So, um, you know, I think this legislation is an important step forward, but I also believe that the governor has to come up with a plan. I think he should be able to do it on his own because we want to protect all of the populations of Massachusetts from Corona. Those in prisons are no different than the goal, right? A human being is a human being is a human being. And our goal and our role should be protect, uh, you know, all populations. We shouldn't have to do file legislation to do that, but if we have to, and that's, that's what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So would you, do you think that the, you know, if we're, if we're trying to, again, not apportion blame, but trying to figure out who's responsible or who are the actors who, uh, could have the most influence uh, the quickest here. Uh, you have cited the governor. Um, is, is that the, the place where action needs to emanate from? Well, if, if it doesn't come from the governor, it needs to come from the legislature. Um, of course, the different sheriffs as well um, have enormous roles in operating their, sheriff, their, their, um, their centers, their jails. And so, but I would hope to see that the governor would provide some leadership around statewide information in terms of what is happening in terms of the public health of all of the inmates in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and what the plan is for the administration to keep those individuals that don't have corona at the moment healthy and how they plan to care for the sick. Um. Okay, Sean, so I, again, I don't want to trivialize them by calling them your pet issues, but I, I, I want to, you know, have a one, one term to, that, that gives you enough flexibility to address, as I mentioned, those things uh, of, of perpetual concern for you um, and find out, again, whether there is, it, it is possible at this time uh, to make any progress in those areas. Um. So yes, I'd love to address that issue. One issue that I do want to talk about real quick is that there have been a couple of pieces of legislation that I, that I have filed in response to Corona-19. And I just want to talk about those really quickly. Sure. One is I have always been a supporter of the way states like Oregon, Washington, Utah, some areas in California vote they vote by mail-in voting. And so I am filing legislation with Representative Dylan Fernandez, who represents Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and parts of Cape Cod, that would allow Massachusetts to move towards mail-in voting in September, for November, and permanently. And I think that is really, really important. Obviously, it's gonna go through the process. There are several similar pieces of legislation that would allow for mail-in voting, some of the questions that need to work out is, you know, we do have a primary system where, mem where voters take different ballots, and that is not how it works in some of the other places that have mail-in voting. But this is something that we should be able to have in Massachusetts. It makes sense. It is safe. None of the states that have current mail-in voting have reported any type of fraud. And so I think that is really, really important. And yeah. as so you say that it's it, it's very important, Sean. And I know that you um, un, that 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 our viewers will understand what the importance would be within uh, the COVID nineteen uh, context. But I'm sure you mean beyond that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So explain a little bit more. Wh why is it important? Uh, or I assume you mean better. Uh, to, to move to a mail-in system? So if you look at states like Oregon and Washington that have transitioned, and Colorado too, which have transitioned to mail-in voting, now some of those states haven't gotten rid of polling locations completely, but they have decreased them and have transitioned to mail-in voting. And what they have found is an increase 
in voting populations. So they have, they have found an increase in those voting, those who are exercising their franchise. And to me, that is really, really appealing and important that mail-in voting allows one to keep the public safe from not making them go to a voting location and getting you know people sick there or getting sick there themselves. Two, but it allows for greater flexibility, right? It allows them to be able to vote from the safety and confines of their own home. And three, they're less likely to forget about voting, right? Because the ballot will be right in front of them. All they have to do is sign, you know, sign the affidavit um, and filling out the, the, the envelope. Uh, uh, Sean, let me, Sean, Sean excuse the interruption, but something just happened with your with your audio it's uh, gotten much less clear not sure if you made a change about uh, 10 to 15 seconds ago i don't believe so how's that uh it's still still the same much much thinner as if you had moved far away from the microphone for some reason no how about now i, I did it so that's kind of strange but uh, is that yeah um well, I think we'll carry we'll carry on. It it still sounds a, a little thin. Maybe we'll be able to just deal with it in post production or whatever. Anyway, this is this is uh, it, it's worth continuing the conversation. Um, we'll we we will do the best we can. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, yeah, no, no problem. So, to me, mail in voting just makes a lot of sense if you care about people voting in greater populations. So. You know, to me, this is going to be something if we can get done in Massachusetts that will allow registered voters to vote in greater numbers. And to me, that is the most important part of this. But also, it is important during the pandemic to allow democracy to continue without voters and the people who work at the polls uh, putting their lives on the line. I don't want to see another uh, Wisconsin where you saw hours of lines just to allow people to exercise their democratic right right um uh so you had and and i think i interrupted you while you were about to mention one other thing yeah so i you know I, i've also filed legislation um here in massachusetts with the raise up coalition um raise up massachusetts which is an act relative to emergency paid sick time um, and to me, this is really, really important, obviously protecting the health and safety of all of our, you know, Massachusetts residents needs to be a top priority. And because of that, no worker in the Commonwealth should have to go to work when they may be sick and contagious and impact others. So, you know, obviously you have the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act that was created that allows for a paid sick leave program but it is inadequate. And the bill that I filed along with Rep. Paul Donato from Bedford and the state Senator Jason Lewis um, in Winchester guarantees all workers up to 10 additional uh, sick days, 80 hours. And to me, that's really, really important and something that a lot of folks are putting a lot of work into, especially during a pandemic. Um, but also these are rights that workers should have even when we're not in a pandemic. So we're working very hard on that piece of legislation too. And I just wanted to raise those two because as you pointed out, James, legislating is happening. It's just not happening for all of the bills that we've talked about in the past. And I'm still working on those bills. Um, but if I were being realistic, um, you know, these pieces of legislation are taking priority because of the current pandemic that we're in. But obviously, the other bills I filed from 100% renewable energy uh, and allowing students with disabilities to go to college and you know health insurance coverage for those who live with multiple sclerosis, they're top priorities as well. And I'm I'll be working very hard to try to get them past this session. You know, we go until, you know, the end of session is July 31st, but I wouldn't be surprised if the legislative session continues into September, October, and November because of this pandemic. And if that does happen, 
during that time, I'm gonna to continue to work to get these pieces of legislation passed. Well, anybody who has listened to, to this conversation, Sean, I think is gonna understand why it is that you and others may not be able to be uh, working on that legislation with the same fervor as usual, given the plethora of concerns that you are addressing. So uh, thanks for uh, the update just to let us know. Um, and thanks in general uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, and, uh, you know, we have always been appreciative of the work you do on our behalf. Uh, it's more important at this moment than perhaps ever before. Um, and you have our confidence, uh, you have our uh, deepest condolences uh, with reference to your dad. Uh, and once again, uh, just thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure, and I wish I could have talked last week, James, and I really appreciate you hosting, as you always do, so outstanding, um, and to ACMI for allowing this to happen and trying to get the information to the residents of Arlington. That is so very important, and I wish you, your viewers, and the staff at ACMI and the residents of Arlington uh, great health over the next many, many weeks to come. Thank you, Sean, and the same to you. Uh, we will talk to you again, I'm sure, soon enough uh, for us to get uh, a, a further update on progress made both within the State House uh, and for and on behalf of Arlington. So uh, this has been a conversation with our State Rep, Sean Garbley. Um, I'm James Milan. You've been watching Talk of the Town. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>